Yeah, it's, I'm excited uh, today to get the opportunity. We're uh, taking a few weeks to uh, deviate from our Acts series and uh, really excited about getting in the Word with you. I forgot it again. Uh, I'm going to have our ushers come and uh, receive an offering for our One More Movement. I did that. That's the second time I did that. Uh, I'm just ready to get in the Word with you. So I'm going to pray. You guys go ahead and receive and I'm going to continue to preach. Uh, thank you, Lord, for uh, just the opportunity to give, to put the gospel in every place on the planet. We thank you. Bless this offering. Spread it. Multiply it. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. Uh, but anyway, I'm, I'm, we're going to take away from, uh, move for a few weeks off of our Acts series. We'll get back to that later. Um, I want to talk to you about this uh, over the next few weeks, Jesus is. And so we're going to be finishing this sentence over the course of uh, the next few weeks with different things. I'm reminded uh, about a burglar that was stalking a neighborhood watching for homes that uh, people left on vacation. And so there was one particular family that he observed that put all their suitcases in a vehicle and left. And so when it got dark, um, he went up to the front door and knocked. Nobody answered, picks the locks, and goes inside the house. Going to rob the house. And when he first steps in, he asks, is anybody here? Uh, and then he hears this voice. Um, I see you and Jesus sees you. So he begins to freak out and uh, he flips, uh, he calls again, who's there? Uh, and he hears the voice again, I see you and Jesus sees you. So he uh, turns his flashlight on. And he starts shining around, and the flashlight, the light beam, catches a, a cage in the corner, and it's a parakeet. And as soon as the light catches the parakeet, he hears that again from the parakeet, reciting this phrase, I see you, and Jesus sees you. As he's looking at this, thinking, how, how ridiculous is this? He hears a gnarly growl from the floor, and he looks down, and he sees a Doberman on the floor. To which, at that moment, the parakeet says, attack, Jesus, attack. And I'm like, that's awesome, right? So, uh, number one, if you're going to rob a house, make sure that they're not taking people to the airport, number one. And number two, make sure that there is no Doberman named Jesus. And so, uh, it really kind of conveys a reality to us today that on a serious note, of which Jesus do you observe? Like, which Jesus do you observe? And you're like, well, I follow Jesus. Okay, which one? You're like, huh? I didn't know there was more than one. Uh, look at this. Here's what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 11, 4. It says, uh, you happily put up with whatever anyone tells you. By the way, that's not, a good, that's not a good comment. And then he goes on and he says, even if they preach a different Jesus than the one we preach. Like, which Jesus do you follow? Which Jesus do you observe? It's a great question, isn't it? It's a question that I want you to think about today, that I want you to process today. It's a question that, that you have to really, really answer in your life. Um, I look at this, there's a lot of uh, Jesuses out there among Christians. A lot of different Jesuses out there. In fact, you talk to one Christian, you're not going to get the straight Jesus as another Christian would. Uh, and here, here's kind of my point, is there are people out there that... Uh, the the kind of like the tolerant Jesus. Uh, it, it's the one that's like, don't say anything offensive. Don't say anything uh, uh, wrong. Or, or don't, don't say the truth. Just be compassionate. Pat kids on the head. Uh, kiss babies. Smiling, tolerant Jesus, right? Uh, there's the other uh, Jesus out there that is the teacher Jesus, right? The, the great ideas, well-spoken, said some stuff we can put on Pinterest or on our wall. And uh, he, he is, uh, he's teacher Jesus, he's a good guy, said some good things, but not God, right? Uh, there, then there's the, what I would call the TNT Jesus, dynamite Jesus, dynamite it's the one that blows up at people, Jesus. The Jesus that really goes to more about what they're against and what they're for. Flies off the handle, uh, attacks everything, ninja, Doberman, kick you in the teeth, judgment, Jesus. And then we've all, without a doubt, ran on to people who represent Jesus to us that is different than the Jesus of the word. Uh, in fact, even among world religions and religions itself, there's a lot of difference in this idea of Jesus. And I'm not trying to be controversial. I am trying to be instructive, though. And I think it's important for us to understand Jesus is one of many reasons why it's not accurate to say all religions are the same. 
And, and it's just the truth. And in fact, uh, the Jehovah Witnesses believe about Jesus that he is a created being. And that he was created by God and then he went on to help create the rest of the world. And that Jesus, that he, they believe, is the archangel Michael. Uh, the Mormons believe that Jesus is a polygamist. Uh, half brother of Satan. And uh, Jesus ultimately will come back, uh, became God, ultimately he became but God, and that's a model for you and us to become God, that you and I uh, will be able to have our own planet, our wives will help us populate uh, their, our planet by them being eternally pregnant. Um, if you're a woman here and you've been pregnant, uh, I don't know how much of heaven that really is. Sounds a little bit like hell to me, uh, just saying. Uh, three maybe good, four good, two good, but like all the time for eternity to be pregnant, not so sure. The Christian scientist, Jesus is not God. The Muslim, Jesus is a prophet. The, the Hindus believe that he is a, uh, a holy man, but not the holy man. The Buddhists believe that Jesus was enlightened, but not as much as their Buddha. So the question is, is which Jesus um, do, do you see, do you observe? It's a good question. I love what C.S. Lewis says. He says this, um, and I put, I'll put it on the screen. It says, I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him that is Christ. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That's the one thing that we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on a level with a man who says he's a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice, and that's the point. I'm advocating for you and I to come to a decision on who Jesus is. And he says, if you read the Bible at all, and you understand what Jesus said, all even about himself, you cannot even come to conclu any conclusion that, about a teacher. That's like not even an option. Like if you have a test, it's not like one of the multiple choice question, the answers. It's not even on the test. Uh, but what is on the test is either this man uh, was and is the son of God, that's, that's like the A, multiple choice, or B, a madman, or C, something worse. Uh, you can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him, and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come up with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He's not left that open to us. He did not intend to. It's really strong words from C.S. Lewis, and, and, and what, what I want to tell you is what you and I think about Jesus is the most important thing in our life. It's massive. And, and uh, look at Mark chapter 8, here's what it says. Jesus and his disciples were around Caesarea Philippi. Uh, on, uh, on the way, he asked them, this is a great question, who do people say, and well, like, what's the word on the street? Uh, who, who do people say, and then they responded, uh, some say Elijah, some say John the Baptist or a prophet. And then he says this, but what about you? I would echo that today. What about you today? Uh, who do you say that I am? And all the things that Peter got wrong, here is one thing he gets right. He says, uh, Peter answered, I love this, you are the Messiah. Bing, bong, boom, shakalaka, he got it right. And, and I would say this, this is still a question that still has to be answered. You say, it is a question that deserves an answer in our lives. I would offer you to make that decision. It is the most important decision on who Jesus is. And so for the next few weeks leading up to Easter, we're locking in on Jesus. We're like putting him in the, in the crosshairs, and we're going to observe who he is through Scripture. Not through our experiences, not through what other people represented him as, but as he is in the Word of God, Right? What does the word say? What, is, what does he mean? And we're going to begin to shape um, some instructional ideas on who Jesus is. And I would tell you this. Uh, I, I'm, the older I get, the more passion I have, not just to inspire you, but to instruct you. See, I, I think I, I, would, I would be more excited that you walk out of here with some sort of continuity in your thinking rather than goosebumps on your arm. See, I, I, I want something inside of you that will last beyond today, that will stick with you, that you can give a, a hope uh, and a reason for the hope inside of you, which is Jesus, right? 
Because so, you need to know that. You need to grow in your thoughts, and we need to grow together. So thank you for being a person that craves instruction, not just inspiration, right? Um, there's a lot of churches, that, that, you know, and people out there that, man, you walk out, and you, you can feel like you're, you can charge hell with a water pistol. I love that. I want to do that, too. Bazooka for Jesus. But also, I want to be able to tell people why I feel the way I feel biblically, right? So let's know the word around here. It's the word that, that will is living and active. It's the word that when everything else passes away, it's the word that will stand. And so Peter answered, it's a good question. So here's Hebrews 12, 2, let us fix our eyes on Jesus. That's what we're doing. We're fixing our eyes on Jesus for the next year. So Jesus is, here's the first uh, thing I want to tell you. Uh, Jesus is number one. That's what I'll tell you today, right? Uh, if you don't get anything out of this, if you don't understand anything I say, he's number one with lights on. Right, I love that, and, and also, uh, yeah, it's even faster lights, and then he can still be the light. So Jesus is number one. I, I love that. Um, and, and let's look at the the book of Colossians because I want to go there. There's a lot of places I could go today that really represent and define Jesus biblically. It's interesting that J. B. Lightfoot tells us about Colossians. He says this: the doctrine of the person of Christ is here in Colossians. He says this, stated with greater precision and fullness than any other of St. Paul's epistles. That's pretty awesome, because Paul wrote a lot of other good stuff, but he's saying, hey, there's there's a lot of potency of who Jesus is in the book of Colossians. So we're going to go to Colossians. And it's important for us to understand the reason why Colossians was written as a letter. It was wrote to people who lived in a culture with a warped understanding of God. The idea of the day in Colossae was there was a lot of shrines and temples. It was a smorgasbord of deity. If I like this about uh, this God, I'll add it to my, to my portfolio of the God that I create. It was like the Build-A-Bear, right, of theology. It was the Build-A-Bear of, the, of, of, of deity in the world in Colossae. And so what Paul does is he's, he's bothered... Um, by this idea that, that, that in that, it's represented that Jesus isn't enough. It's this idea that, that you need Jesus and something else. Uh, and, and, and Paul comes in with, with guns blazing, and he's like, hey, by the way, Jesus is number, he, he's the most important, he's number one. And he writes to correct the reality of bad thinking in people's lives. And I would tell you, uh, we don't get the opportunity to take Jesus and make him to fit what we like and don't like. Uh, we just don't get the idea to do that. Uh, I would love to write Coke and, and say, hey, um, I'm going to change the flavor of what you made, right? I'm going to change it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make it a little bit more zesty, a little bit less uh, potent, and, and that's what I'm going to do. Uh, but I don't get the right to do that because uh, it's, I didn't trademark the Coke, and, and we didn't trademark Jesus to be able to weigh in the fact of creating him the way that we want. Uh, you can't just go down the cafeteria line and like some things about Jesus, but then leave the things that you don't like. Because I'll tell you, the things that you don't like, though they may stir you to frustration, they will keep you safe. He didn't say things to... Uh, tick you off. He says things because he sees bigger than what you see in your life. And so he's, he's just, yeah, baby, he's number, he's number one. So I'm going I'm to unpack this today. Um, look at this, uh, Colossians chapter one. I, I, I was originally going to go through uh, 19, and I'll touch a little bit on it, but I'm just going to do one verse today. Is that okay? Uh, or one verse, Colossians 1.15, here's what it says. Christ, everybody say Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. Say visible. visible. Say invisible. invisible. And look at this. He existed before anything was created and is supreme. Everybody say supreme. supreme. Love that. Over all creation, he is supreme. Why is Jesus number one? I'll give you two thoughts today. Number one, Jesus is revealing. Love that. Uh, here's what verse 15 says. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. So, ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the only one that's ever existed on planet Earth that can make God more clear. Here he is, Jesus. That's what he's saying, right? Like, wow. And because of the life of Jesus on this earth, 
we're able to know an unknown God becomes known, a unseen God becomes seen. It's remarkable. In fact, uh, John 1.18 says, no one has ever seen God, but the unique one who him, is himself God, more than a teacher, he's himself God, is near to the Father's heart. Look at this. He, speaking of Jesus, has revealed God to us. So God has never communicated anything more clearly about who he is other than in the person of Jesus. Um, the word, one of my favorite words, I just, I just like it. I like how it's spelled out on, 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 the, on my iPad. I like how it's spelled out when you write it. It's doppelganger. <laughs> I think that's just a, such a cool word, don't you? Doppelganger. I just like that. Well, what's a doppelganger? Doppelganger, everybody has a twin on the earth. That's what they say. It's somebody who kind of resembles somebody else, right? Uh, people say, Heath, your doppelganger is Brad Pitt. And I'm like, of course it is. That is so untrue. <laughs> they don't say that. <laughs> That's what I say when I'm sleeping, right? Uh, but what they really say is uh, Ralphie off a of Christmas story. Uh, and then the one that really bothers me is Ricky Schroeder. <laughs> Do you remember, does anybody remember Ricky Schroeder? I mean, off of Silver Spoons? I, I hate that. Uh, he is, he, sorry, Ricky, if you're watching this, I uh, like he's watching this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you are U G L Y. You ain't got no alibi. You ugly, Ricky. All right. <laughs> so uh, he's, I just think he is. And and so if I'm Ricky, I'm Ricky. I'm ugly for Jesus, I guess. But uh, but look at this. Jesus is not God's doppelganger. It's not like uh, Jesus is like this strong resemblance of God, like the Father. Like there's a strong similarity. It's not about coincidental resemblance it's not um, the word here image uh, the word that we see the invisible image or the visible image of the invisible God that word image is the word we get icon or in our language icon and what it means is is an exact copy a perfect portrait uh, there's an exactness to it not a resemblance of it so what's interesting is uh, there used to be copy machines that were branded, and they still may be, but icons, icon copier. And, uh, you know, we used to, <laughs> I think one time, uh, it's been so long ago since our kids were tiny, but I think a few times when we were youth pastors, we'd take our kid when we were changing their diaper and we'd stick their butt right on the copy machine and put copy, and you'd see little baby butts coming out. This is pretty awesome, right? Have you ever put your hand on a copier and push copy? It's amazing, isn't it? Like you could see, your, you could see all, all the lines and fingerprints because it's not, it's not like kind of like, it is an exact representation. In fact, Hebrews says that. He, uh, and, and it says this in Hebrews that, that in verse uh, 3 of chapter 13, before I say that, John 14, 9 says, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. That's what Jesus is saying. Anybody that's seen me. So in other words, when it comes to revealing, Jesus is the image of God in that he is the icon, the visible display of God. Any, hey, you want to see God? You see him. You're looking at him. We see the Father? You're looking at him. That's what he says. He's revealing who God is. People wonder, who is God? Who is God? Well, look at Jesus. That'll tell you who God is. And, and, and we understand that Jesus is the icon, the exact representation of God, in which Hebrews says in verse 3 of chapter 13, the Son, of, that's Jesus, is the radiance of God's glory. Look at this. And the exact, everybody say exact, yes. representation of his being. Jesus is God. So the question is, how do I know? Like, you're trying to figure out today, maybe, you're, you're, you're shopping, and you're trying to figure out you know, I've heard a lot about who Jesus is. I've heard a lot about this God thing. And, I, and you're trying to figure out what you feel. Well, that's good. The good news is, is that you don't have to ask questions or look in places that won't give you an exact picture. The exact picture, the exact visible display is found and revealed in the person of Jesus. So if you have a question about God, you can simply look at Jesus to answer the question. So if you're like, man, I, I need to know, uh, how do I know if God is loving? Well, you look at Jesus. You just watch him. Think about the woman caught in the act of adultery. Here they are wanting to stone her. And he says, he that's without sin cast the first stone. And, and so many times in my life, I am worthy of a stone. 
Anybody else worthy of a stone? There's dumb things I do. Dumb. Am I the only broken one in the house? I mean, there are times that I'm like, I am a numbskull. And I want to know, God, I want to know if you're still loving to me. And then, well, here's the question. That's a great question. Look at Jesus. And what Jesus do? Uh, he says, hey, go and live your life. Uh, don't live, don't sin anymore. Go and live your life of freedom. Go, go and sin no more. Powerful stuff, right? I don't care what you've done. I don't care how many times you screwed up in your life. I don't care how much you feel like a numbskull. The reality is, is that he is loving no matter what you've done. And you find that because that's revealed in who Jesus is. I love that. This big, enormous CEO of the universe, big G-O-D, that's a big thing to put in this little head. I need to know if he absolutely will listen to me when I talk to him. Or do I have to take th stones and chuck them to heaven? Does he listen to me? Well, you want to know, you just look at Jesus. I love it. This, we, uh, this In the, our reading, uh, we're reading uh, through the New Testament as a church, and uh, the reading captured blind Bartimaeus recently. And here he is on the side of the road. Jesus is passing by. He can hear him, but he can't see him. He knows something's different, but he can't get to him because of the crowd. So he starts to cry out, son of David, have mercy on me. Son of David, have mercy on me. Would you believe that people around him are like, shh, shh. Like, don't bother him. This, this Jesus is way too important to mess with your little blindness. But then, I love, son of David, have mercy on me. And I'm sure there was a roar in the crowd. But somehow, Jesus has impeccable hearing for the voice of those who are small in the world's eyes. And he tunes his ear in, and he stops on the road. And he says, hey, bring him to me. He says, what do you want? I want to see. He says, then you can see. He heals him. Does God, does God, uh, does he listen to me? Well, look at Jesus. He has this impeccable ability to tune his voice in or tune his hearing in to the small voice in your life when you're in need. He hears you. How do we know that? Well, you know that because he is the visible image of the invisible God. The, the known, the unknown becomes known. So I want to know if, he's, if, he, uh, if he forgives. Heath, you know how many times I screwed up this week? I, I get that. Well, we, we see that, that he hangs out with the lady at the well. They start having conversation. Will he forgive me? And, and, and this lady uh, starts, and he says, go and get your husband. And, and she says, I don't have a husband. He says, you're right. You have, you, uh, you have five, and the one you're with is your living boyfriend now. He calls her on his stuff. See, he is truth. So, some people don't like the idea that he's truth, but, you can, but he also is grace, right? Here's the truth, and you can't know if you're sick if you don't know the truth. And if you live in denial, you don't know the truth. The reason is he's calling you out with truth is because you need, you need to know how sick you are so that you can receive the medicine of his grace in your life. He's not here looking to just show you you're wrong because he's narcissistic and judgmental. He is revealing the fact that you're falling short because he has a remedy that is himself. So he is truth, but he's also grace. And he says to her, you know what? Um, he, he, she gets so enamored by who he is. Leaves her water pot. That's why she's at the well. Leaves her water pot. And she goes and tells the people, I love this. What does she say? He told me everything I've ever done. Oh, but, but there's something about him that I don't feel put off. I want to chase him. In fact, she tells the whole town, the whole town gets saved, and he says, we don't believe because simply because you told us, we believe that he's the savior of our world because he, we saw him for ourselves, which indicates you said he was the savior of the world. You had a change. Now we have a change because of what we've seen and not just heard. The point I'm trying to make is, is he forgiving? Absolutely. I don't care how many husbands you have. You have five, you have 50, you have 500, God help you, but God has the ability to forgive you no matter what don't care you have five times as much whatever you want to put in there five times as much as promiscuity five times as much financial not uh, not integrous five it doesn't matter he forgives that's what he is screw up 500 times doesn't matter he, i love that so you want to know about god look at jesus that's the point he is the exact representation of who god is so what's the what's the point when you get serious about jesus 
like serious, you start to see God like you've never seen him before. I love that. I love that. I love the story of a guy named Joe that was a drunk. Got converted at a mission and uh, became one of the greatest assets of that mission. In fact, before that, people said, you know, he's just a dirty wino, wrote him off. He's just going to live his, 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 his existence in the ghetto. Comes to know the Christ and becomes incredibly changed to the point that he starts serving at the mission. Serving. He'll, he'll take the, the drunks off the street, can't even hardly walk straight, and walks them and tucks them into bed. They're, they puke in the middle of the hallway. He gets a mop and he cleans it up. Toilet. They come in and, and use, the, use the sink and the toilet and the bathroom as a shower because they haven't had the ability to shower or bathe in days, if not weeks. And, and he goes in behind them and he cleans up after them. Amazing, this guy, Joe. And, and I love how if you've had a bad taste in your mouth about a Jesus that's not the biblical Jesus, God, if you'll be watching, has the ability to send the right Jesus through other people to your life. And, and here's Joe, and Joe is, is hanging out and serving in the mission, and a guy in the mission, um, the, the, pre, the, the executive director is speaking and preaching, he's preaching on the gospel. And a guy that walked in off the street runs up at the end, and he's crying, make me like Joe, make me like Joe. His, his knees hit the concrete, and the tears uh, almost splashed the front of the platform, and he's crying, make me like Joe. And the executive director's like, man, this guy, I got to help this guy out. And he says, you need to say, make me like Jesus. And he looks at him quizzically and says, is he like Joe? Would people get confused with your life as you reveal it to others, and they don't know if Jesus is like Joe or Joe is like Jesus? See, he has the ability, if you're watching, he reveals still through his body the people of God. Number two, here we are. You ready? Why? Why? Most important. Why? Number one. Great question. Here it is. Um, Jesus is supreme. And I'll, let me give you some buzzwords for that. Um, supreme, highest, most important, the priority. There you go. Look at this. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. Look at this. He existed before anything was created. Look at this. And is supreme over all creation. I want you to notice he's not an visible image, but the visible image. So my point is God has no other son. Jesus was God's first God's best and God's only. He has no other plan. There's no other way to God except through Jesus. And I know that amongst people who are like, um, that, that, that want to believe that Jesus is one of the many ways, that there's just simply inaccuracy when it comes to what Jesus said about that. Because Jesus very much so was clear that he is the only way. And, and that's because, look, I mean, um, the facts are the facts. The facts are... Um, that, that I'm never going to be in the NBA, right? Uh, that's just the facts. You, can't, you can argue all day. Man, you could grow a little bit. Man, you could play all day. But just the fact is the fact. And, and just because there are facts about him, it doesn't it mean it's just the facts. He is it. He is highest. He is. And, and our definition of him doesn't change the, the composition of him being the highest. See, he, he just is, whether you want to believe it or not, whether you want to receive it or not, whether you want to argue or not, he just, this, he's just like, this is who I am. I can't apologize that I am the way that I am. I can't apologize that I'm barely over five feet tall. Jesus is like, I can't apologize. I'm supreme. And just because facts are facts, it doesn't mean that his attitude is that I'm the best. It's, that's not his attitude. But he is still very much so supreme. In fact, he claims it, and he says, Jesus answered, I'm the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You want to get to heaven, Father? The Father's in heaven, if you, you're going to go through me. Here's Acts chapter 4, verse 12. Look at this. Salvation is found. This idea of, of the ability to, to when, I, when, I, when I leave this life and I enter the next life, this idea of being saved and having an eternal life in heaven, that's salvation. Salvation is found in no one else. Look at this. For there is no other name, that's Jesus, under heaven, 
given to mankind by which we must be saved. Why? It's because he's supreme. It's because he's the most important. Jesus is the highest. He's God. There's no one better. There's nobody above him. And here's what Colossians is doing. He is placing Jesus as number one. When we get into Colossians, he is making sure every believer understands he is the greatest, he is the supreme, and he is the su- supreme over all that is in the world. That's what he's saying. That's, that's, that's who Jesus is, scripturally. In fact, Colossians 2.9 says this, For in him, speaking of Jesus, all fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. And let's be honest. I mean, when you read the Bible, the, the supreme message, the most important message, the message of the Bible is Jesus. You come into Genesis and people screwed up. The creation, they screwed up. And, and shortly after, the remedy is Jesus. It says that, you know what? Uh, the, the seed of the woman will... will, will um, the offspring will destroy the head of the serpent one day. So not too much after our mess-ups become the remedy of Jesus Christ. And then, of course, we see that, that the historical books, that they talk about the longing and looking of, of the Messiah that is the Christ, the one that's going to undo the sin of, that man, of mankind and the sin in the garden. Then you start reading the prophetic books. They predict what he's going to look like, what he's going to do when he comes. How do we know? There's strong prophetic prophecies on exactness of this messiah coming and then of course he comes the gospels new testament jesus comes born a virgin lives a sinless life dies resurrects jesus and then of course in acts his ministry continues through his body by the power of the holy spirit that's what acts is about the acts of the apostles through the holy spirit continuing the ministry of christ luke makes it very clear that that what he began to to do uh, what he began to, to be, it's, it's continuing through, it doesn't end. And he starts setting up worship places. The world, Jesus goes global right through the church. And of course we have the epistles, the governance and the worship, what church looks like on a local level of worship around one person that is Jesus Christ. And then of course we have revelation, uh, the, the idea that the Jesus that came as a baby will someday come back as a warrior, Jesus the supreme message is Jesus. You can't. In fact, after the resurrection, he's on the road uh, to Emmaus. He's got two dudes with him. And here's what is said in Luke 24, 27. It says, then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets, meaning scripture, explaining from all the scriptures the things concerning himself. He said, hey guys, remember when it said this? That's me. Hey guys, remember when this was foreshadowed? That's me. Hey guys, remember when, that's me. Remember when there's a lamb that was slain for the sins of, that's me, I'm the lamb. Jesus is supreme, right? He's supreme and he's the message. Look at verse uh, 15, it says, it it uses the word firstborn over all creation. Firstborn is important. Uh, One, some translations use supremacy, some use firstborn. And I want to say this because I think um, some religions get wrongly communicate the idea where that's to mean that Jesus is created. And then once he's created, then he becomes the creator of things. Because they say he's firstborn, they, you know, he's the first one, the first one ever in creation, and, and then he was created. What we have to understand is, is that's not what this means. Firstborn in this text means importance. It's why they, they change the word supremacy in there. He's the most important. So when the word says firstborn, it is not talking about chronology, it's talking about supremacy. It's, it's, so you have to understand, and I don't mean to be, con, I, I'm just being honest, because that's the way I, the only way I know how to be, is the, is it's the Jehovah Witnesses believe that. And, and, and you need to understand why you don't believe that, because when you look at that scripture, you can't sit there and say it means birth order, it means supremacy. In fact, uh, Colossians 1.18 reiterates this concept. He says he's, he's the beginning and the firstborn among the dead. Uh, note uh, that, that was Jesus the first to come back from the dead? The answer is no. Lazarus did. The young boy in his own funeral procession did. Jairus' daughter did. 
So why is he firstborn among the dead? And if you look, the reason why we can't say that's birth order is because we understand that that's not true, that he wasn't the firstborn among the dead. Now, if you understand that he's the most important of the dead, which he is, then it begins to make sense. He is supreme. He is the highest because in his death and in his life, he provides something different than Lazarus, than Jairus' daughter. They died and came back from the dead, but he died and resurrected and uh, finished the plan of redemption redemption in our lives. Nobody else can say I died and came back to life and perfected the plan of salvation for mankind. So that's why he's like the deal. It's why he's number one, because nobody else, even if they've been resurrected, cannot say that they were the perfect sacrifice to die for the sins of mankind. The reason he is supreme is because he did it for you and I. Does that make sense? It's a boom shakalaka, man. And, and this is not just something kind of to work into our lives. That means that, that he is supreme. That means that he's the most important in our life. Like he's the most important and in, in the, the, pri, the priority in our relationships. It's not God, wife, you know, friends, job. No, no, no. It's not that. It, it, it's, it's God. It's God. In my marriage, first. It's God in my friendships, first. It's God in my job, first. See, see, it's not God and then everything else. It's God in everything else, first. Supremacy, most important. Most important in my sexuality, most important in my finances, most important in my parenting, most important in my identity. He is the supreme in my educational pursuits and what I watch when no one's around and what I say when no one's around. He is the priority and he is the king of kings and lord of lords and what I, I, everything requires me to put him supreme in my life. It's not just something I kind of flirt with and kind of attach to my life and I feel good like they did build a bear back in the day. I got, he, he deserves to be, to be number one. He is. Right out of the gate, Paul establishes that. Here's the point. When you put Jesus first, you get everything life has to offer that God desires for you. If you get Jesus out of sequence, your life will never be what it was intended to be. If it's four, if he's four or he's five, you're just not going to get the rhythm. Here's what the Bible says. Seek first the kingdom and his righteousness and all these other things will be added unto you. If he's not first, then you don't get the things added to you. If he's even second, that's the first place loser. So supreme, he deserves our worship. He, he's the deal. He's the highest. He's number one. So the question is, um, what do you think about him? In your life. I mean, I mean, powerful, right? Here's, I want you to look at Colossians if you have your Bible. The first few verses are, are, are magnificent. I added these a little bit later. I was looking at first, or Colossians rather, chapter one earlier in the verses, and I just kind of was awestruck by something that Paul was trying to teach about faith. And, and it has all to do with Jesus being number one. And what Paul is mentioning is why Jesus is number one in the opening of his letter, because Jesus is the object or the source of faith. So, so here's my point. Colossians 1, 4, it says this. Paul is, is, it, is it encouraging the church of Colossae, and he says, for we have heard of your faith. I want you to look at that word in Christ Jesus. Um, that's what your faith is in. He's acknowledging that's what their faith in, that, that Jesus is the object or the source of their faith, and I'll tell you why that's important. And then it goes on, he says, and your love for all God's people. I look at this. I wish I had time to preach on this. I don't. But here is all the things that, that happen when, when your faith is in Jesus. Uh, you get a love for all God's people, which comes from you get a confident hope of what have, has been reserved for you in heaven. You get a reservation in heaven. That's why my faith is in him. Uh, the reason my faith is in him is because of uh, the, first, the first hearing uh, the truth of good news. So the reason uh, Paul is saying, I understand why your faith is in Christ, because there's truth in that. Uh, and it's something that's true, uh, that, that's, you, you don't put your life into something that's not true. You put your life into something that's true, and I know it's true because it works, right? So there's truth there. And then it's good news. Like those are, That's reasons why they're putting uh, their faith in Christ. Then he goes on to say, he says, this uh, same good news that came to you is going over all the world. 
And then he says this, it's bearing fruit everywhere by changing lives. So in other words, I see why you have faith in Christ, because it changes lives. Like if you, look, the reason, it, it, there's so many reasons why the, the, the source of Jesus is your faith is because one of the reasons is because uh, there's all kinds of fruit. So hey, look, you, you could sit there and say uh, that, that it's not worthy to have faith in Christ, but I would say it's worthy because your life is a testimony that that's a place to put your faith in. It's amazing, right? It's awesome. I love that. So, um, uh, you know, so my point is a man from a warm climate. Uh, went up to Canada and, and was mesmerized by a frozen lake. Gets on it, jumps on it, dances on it. He's like, I get to walk on water. I mean, just pumped. Warmer climate, goes to Canada, jumps on a lake, big, thick ice. The same guy, not knowing about how ice can be thick or thin, goes to the States, finds a lake, f- jumps on it, falls through the ice. Feels like a total idiot. Doesn't realize that there's thin ice and thick ice because he's, he's from warm, a warm climate. But I appreciate the, the analogy because I want you to know it's not the faith or the size of the faith that bears dependability. It's the object or the source of faith that is the key. See what I'm saying? So, so, so my point is, is I don't care how much faith you have, when you dance on thin ice, you're going to fall through. And Paul puts a premium on the source that is dependable and not the size of the faith that is insignificant in what he's saying. I don't care how big your faith is, the question that's more important is what is your faith in? And what Paul is saying is he is worthy to be the source because he delivers. And I can put my life on thin ice and know that it's not going to fall through because he is worthy and high and supreme and number one. I trust him because of the fruit of faith that happens in other people's lives. That's a phenomenal. It's a boom shakalaka. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to take this video. Look at this video real quick. Uh, it's a guy that's retired now, and he shares uh, what Jesus means to him. And my, my answer is, if anybody asks you who is Jesus, that it would be as personal as him. Check it out. The Bible says my king is the king of the Jews. He's a king of Israel. He's a king of righteousness. He's a king of the ages. He's a king of heaven. He's a king of glory. He's the king of kings. And he's the Lord of lords. That's my king. I, I wonder do you know him. <laughs> my king is a sovereign king. No means of measure can define his limitless love. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. Do you know him? He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He is the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the only one qualified to be an all sufficient savior. I wonder if you know him today. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleans the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captive. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the age. He rewards the diligent. And he purifies the meek. I wonder if you know him. He's a key to knowledge. He's a wellspring of wisdom. He's a doorway of deliverance. He's a pathway of peace. He's a roadway of righteousness. He's a highway of holiness. He's a gateway of glory. Do you know him? Well, his life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. And his yoke is easy. And his burden is light. I wish I could describe him to you. He's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. Well, you can't get him out of your mind. You see, you can't get him 
He's the source. And the question isn't, do I have faith? The question is, where is my faith? You put your faith in, and money is your faith. You're going to fall through the ice. If another person on this earth is your faith, you'll fall through the ice. But the reason Jesus is number one is because he's proven that he can hold you up. Nobody else can do that. He's supreme. I want to challenge you. I want our altar team to come, prayer team to come. Let's look at our connect card real quick, couldn't we? Number one is um, today I accept Jesus in my life for the first time. I want to tell you, he holds you up. You've tried a lot of things. He's the only thing that can deliver. And man, I, I have a push here for water baptism. I'd love to see you. If you gave your life to Christ and you've never been water baptized on Easter to, give your, to, get, to be water baptized. Number two is I desire to make Jesus supreme in my life by making him in the priority in all I do. I don't care what you've done yesterday. Today you can make him supreme. Today you can. I didn't, I screwed up. That's all right. Make, just make it priority today. Number three, look at this. I want to know more about God through reading through the New Testament this year. The reason why we're doing the Bible reading is because it reveals the Father. It's awesome. Number four, the last one is, man, I desire for others to know who Jesus is and will invite them. Man, I want, I want people to know who Jesus is. Stand with me in this place. Turn your connect card in. If you're new with us today, I'd love to connect um, with you in the connect room. I think Pastor Ryan was here. I don't know if he's in this gathering or not. There he is. Ryan Claire, love you, man. So glad you're here, bro. Let's give Ryan Claire a hand. I, yeah, love you. So glad you're here. Co labor in faith, and just I just want to give you some props, bro. You're one of my heroes, man. Love your spirit, humility. And, um, Let's worship. When God's done with you, you're free to go. I'm not going to come back and say, have a great day. Um, when God's done with you in this moment, you're free to go. I love you so much. Get some ministry today. Let me pray for you. Jesus, we want to make you number one. Amen.